Bonjour, merci beaucoup que vous êtes ici. Euh, euh, je parle un petit peu en français, mais c'est pas possible de faire de toutes les présentations en français. J'étudie euh, en français trois, trois, trois ans, mais j'ai le niveau de B1 seulement. C'est pourquoi je switch to English. So sorry, not able to do this full presentation in French. But I'm really happy to be here, uh, friend in, in uh, DevOps France, in Paris. Paris is amazing. Yes, I just love this town. As uh, you know, the weather is strange, by the way. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it, is it okay like this? It's not okay. Well, it, it, it's too much cold. Yes. Uh, so um, although I've been to Dunkirk, you know, Shelechti. <laughs> and it was like the same, so it's okay for their part, yes? <laughs> anyway, th so thank you. Um, thank you for being part of this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Heldon Nima and virtual threats. So uh, you know what company I work for. So if I show you this slide, that means that I work for Oracle. Yes, because uh, well, when, whenever something changes and you take business decisions, you have to consult your um, um, legal guys. But um, that's the way it should be. So my name is Dmitry. I'm, I'm coming to you from Sofia, from Bulgaria. So I'm part of the Bulgarian Java user group. Um, I'm colleague there, and uh, I send many, many greetings from our community to your wonderful community. And um, yes, I write code for Oracle, so I'm mostly available in uh, in uh, Twitter, so if you have any any questions, just tweet me there. And if you're in Mastodon, just add this at the end. Yeah, well, Twitter is not dead as far as I see. Yes, uh, although all we wanted, yeah. Anyway, uh, so uh, we will jump directly to task definition, but not the code. So everybody starts like, okay, we are going to do code immediately. Run the code, it compiles, goes to cloud, runs, and you say, ah, oh, well, no, my talk is going to be different. I will show you a lot of slides. I'm old-fashioned. But after the slides, there will be nice demos. So once again, the most com common task of today, we need to create microservice because microservice architecture is something that is, you know, it's very common. It's uh, available in the clouds. They bill you very nice there. And uh, yes, we all write microservices. And of course, if we write microservices, you probably saw this slide, actually. What would you do to write microservice? You'll take this thing. Let's be honest, huh? Yes. Well, because Josh Long is cool. Who's been on Josh Long talk? Yes, he is just, he's just awesome. I love this guy. I met him 13 years ago, and he's the same. He never changes. Yes, he's awesome. But there are a few buts. Uh, and uh, this one but is like it's not very much standard. That means that everything you write is just like you know it's a, it's a it's a, um it's a framework which lives its own life and can be changed and if it changes that you have to conform the changes so on so on, and uh, you know who's been on the talk you see you saw this slide yes, it usually takes more than a hundred megabytes per per microservice so John says it's okay but I don't think so because all microservices are usually like ten megabytes, so. Yes, that's the way people think, but you know, there's some people that actually get it uh, in, the, in the community and said, okay, we need to create a standard for microservices world, and it should not be Jakarta EE. Because Jakarta EE is simply too big, sorry. Yes, and they sat together and they organized something called MicroProfile. So this MicroProfile uh, is an open source community specification. That means that this guys uh, from uh, mostly from uh, Many companies, you see IBM, Red Hat, Payara, Oracle, of course, Tommy Tribe, and even Microsoft somehow got there. I got no idea how. But they're there, and they're very active. And they actually create these specifications for, for microprofile words. That means that um, whenever, like, you know, you want to create a microservice which is standard, you most probably would likely to use microprofile. Because why? Actually, technically, it all starts with three specifications, but now they're like 13, at least at MicroProfile 5. There's also MicroProfile 6 available on the website. It looks a little bit different. But I usually show this slide with the idea that uh, uh, these specifications are documents and TCKs that you actually implement, and uh, each vendor implements. That means that the code you create, the code you actually run and create, 
is the same. It's not only the code. You can see even the configuration here is also part of it. We, we, not only the code is portable. We also need to move around configuration. And that means that whenever you write code, it will be working OK on every platform, on every vendor's implementation of this microprofile. Now, that means that uh, if you choose to, you know, on the previous talk, for example, they were talking about Quarkus. Quarkus is also partially, it's not fully microprofile compatible. But uh, if you take this code from Quarkus and drop it to Helidon, I'm going to talk about, it will simply work. You don't need to rewrite anything. You don't need to, um, you know, understand why this annotation works differently than the other, although it's the same annotation or something like this. It will simply work because it conforms the annotation. And as you see here, it's not Jacquard EE or Java EE because these annotations, this, this specification was specially created for, for microservices board. Microservices is a typical example of distributed computer system, like, you know, like, like in the computer science that we learn. And what is, what is the main, main feature of a distributed system? Who can say? Who can say? Huh? It can fail. <laughs> like you know, each part of it can fail independently from the other. Yes, and we and we should really care about this. That's why you have this fault tolerance specification. We cares about it. This has health to check if the service is up and running. There is uh, uh, there is metrics to do all the telemetry information. One business request can take many services, that's why I have open tracing. And yes, so these specifications are made for, for microservices world. And we, from Helidon, yes, um, decided to use this, uh, this uh, uh, specifications. Okay, it's nice, lovely, we have, we have uh, like, you know, this, uh, this uh, set of specifications, they are all written. Uh, they are all like, you know, when you open the specification, this endless document. Uh, ha have you ever tried to read the full document? Like, you know? Yeah, he wrote it, actually. <laughs> this is the guy who wrote it. Yes, and uh, uh, um, yes, none of you actually tried. I had to implement some of the stuff, so I read it. It's painful. But the idea is that, yes, it's nice. It's very, it's still nicely made. It's very, uh, uh, how you say, uh, well, a lot of effort has been put, but have we ever think about performance in like, in a very fundamental way? Uh, how it's done, why it's done this way, and what is achievable with these specifications that we have? Yes, and what are actually the performance issues that we have here in our microservices world? Like, you know, what dealing, we, we, we I mean the vendors. So, um, we mostly deal with what is called massive concurrency. So a lot of requests are coming. There's a lot of requests are like um, concurrently coming to us. Our system has to serve for like very big amounts of very quick requests and quickly respond. So uh, with some limited resources. And the idea is once again, we handle short living request calls. Well, if we handle something long, we can offload it like differently. So I'm gonna talk about it. And yes, uh, actually, why is that important? Because now we pay for everything in the clouds. Clouds are awesome. We, we, everybody, like, you know, when we're talking, in the cloud, you only pay for what you use. Exactly, you pay for what you use and you pay a lot. Like, <laughs> sorry, that's, that's the real world. But uh, the idea is that if you're using each of the resources, uh, so it's a good idea to actually minimize each, um, usage of each of these resources just to minimize your cloud bills. And here comes the idea of that performance, how your resources are used. And today I'm going to tell you about, uh, I would say, a, a, we'll take a small journey of, of, of uh, Helidon, actually, how it was, how we moved from blocking to reactive and blocking again. And we will see why uh, with uh, the newest uh, technology called virtual threads, we're actually uh, uh, achieving, we're, we're moving to a fully new era, I would say. Okay, let's jump a little bit in our small Helidon story. So as I say, I work for Helidon or uh, Helidon project in, uh, in Oracle, so I'm part of this wonderful team. 
And if you don't know what Helidon is, so it's a, a framework for developing cloud native microservices. It is a service, but it's not a serverless container. So it's not Jakarta E. So it's just something which is very fast, very quick, but it does not fully comply to Jakarta E. It complies to MicroProfile specification. We're going to talk about later. We have our philosophy of using as little uh, dependence on third party libraries as possible. And we also have uh, this, uh, this, um, idea to always follow the latest Java release. I'm going to talk about it later. We're Kubernetes friendly and we have multiple flavors actually. And um, the, actually the best part of it is that it's completely open source. Although it's Oracle, it's available to us under Apache 2.0 license. That means that everything you need is in GitHub. You can just come there, submit an issue if you have, uh, you know, uh, take an issue if you want, I don't know. There's a, there are also such people, I'm, I'm very thankful for them, that they help the community. Uh, or you can propose some, some something that you will be useful for you. So it's really open source. It's one of the first Oracle's open source projects. So I'm really, really, really happy to work with it. So our philosophy is always to follow the latest job at this release. That means that Helidon 2 was for made for uh, Java 11, Helidon 3 was made for Java 17, and Helidon 4, which is coming, will be Java 17, uh, Java 21, sorry. That means that we always take the best from Java world and apply it to our code. And yes, as I told you, we have multiple uh, flavors. It's actually a historical fact that uh, uh, um, first we actually took Netty as an our foundation. So maybe probably we'll see this slide. Uh, on top of it, we created this Helidon Reactive, which is actually a framework for developing microservices. And then on top of it, we uh, made the micro profile. So that means that technically when you receive, uh, when you get this Helidon uh, product, you have two main flavors up right now. This Helidon MP, which stands for micro profile, and Helidon SE, which stands for, we call it standard edition, actually, because we follow Java and Java SE and Helidon SE. This is kind of a naming. So if you use Helidon MP, you use this micro profile way of coding, which is, let's be honest, inspired by Spring Boot. That means there are a lot of annotations. Yes, and a lot of magic happens, but it's fairly fast. If you want pure performance, you go to Helidon SE, which is fully reactive framework. When the only annotation is used, it is overwrite. No other annotations. So it's pure, powerful Java. And we're going to talk about these flavors a little bit later. So once again, the main idea is we have different layers. We have Netty as a foundation, as an engine. We have Helidon Reactive, which is actually a wrapper around this Netty to allow us to implement this, uh, a, uh, this um, specifications that I show you later for <laughs> microservices world. And then we created this layer for micro profile, which actually conforms to the standard. That means that if you move from I don't know, Quarkus or something else to Helidon, you just drop the card in and it works because it's standard. If you receive, if you actually work with Helidon MP, so you get not only this standard specification, but actually even more, uh, there are standalone microprofile specifications like long running action, like GraphQL support, reactive operators, and say, so you also get them out of the box. And even more, you get the transaction and persistence as well. So that means that we're not so like, you know, disconnected from the world. If you, uh, we know that, that uh, microservices talk to databases, so we have uh, persistence support. We know that they can do WebSocket, so we have it. So we took some of the Jakarta specification. By the way, I really like this idea that these specifications are so modular and um, we can easily like drop into this code and it works. So, and uh, once again, what is cool about and why we support uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, latest Java is that we have, you see we have most of the frameworks have two types of builds, like regular Java build and, and native image Java build. Uh, we have the third one, which is lately not very much supported, but we are out of the box modular that means that we use Java modularity from Java Post 9 world, and that means that you can create custom JVMs and just throw away the code you don't need. And that's why you have better memory footprint, usage, etc., etc. Startup times, it's simply good, so it works. And I will uh, say that I probably think we are the only one framework right now which fully supports CDI, because many other, um, uh, uh, I mean, um, 
framework like non 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 servlet container, yes, which fully supports CDI because many other competitors they try to like tweak or cheat. They have different implementation, and we use for our extensions we use CDI. That means that if you have a CDI extension, so one question next talk is about CDI from uh, our good friend uh, uh, Antoine de Saint de Bois. I said correctly, yes. Just definitely go there, and you will know more about CDI. Yes. Uh, so CDI, um, we use extensions. That means that every extension which is available in the market, you drop in, and it works, which is cute. And even in Graal VM native image. But once again, this is fine when you are focused on portability and service to a kind of a average, average kind of user, because all of the APIs that we have there, most of them, most of the APIs are blocking. Blocking, that means that um, uh, you just call a method and wait for this method to give you the result. And that's it. Yeah, there are some base and completable futures. Yes, they're working on that. But once again, they're blocking by their nature. So, and this is what we come to held on reactive with the idea is that whenever you need performance, propose our users to use Helidon SE. And we, in between, call it the danger zone. <laughs> because, like you know, you have everything, but it's extremely fast without the overhead uh, given to you by microprofile. That means that, I'll, I'll be really quick here, uh, that means that your numbers getting really, really lower, and uh, it's also modular. And why it is so good? Because we have our the philosophy of always using not using external dependencies. This is crucial because our main customers are uh, like very much in the audits. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, well, you're mostly developers, but if you work in a bank, if you work in state enterprise, et cetera, et cetera, there are always audits, how, what, what are the dependencies, how are they used, what are the CVEs under these dependencies, and so on. This is painful, and we always do our way. And that's why we have created our own Helidon Reactive Engine, which is uh, uh, contributed by David Karnak himself, actually, who is the inventor of, of Reactive. Uh, the you know the, uh, the the reactive paradigm, the father I would say, but we didn't want to follow the idea of Spring could call it Flux and Mono because, well, uh, I don't know what Flux is. I don't know. I can say what Mono is, but Flux no. We call it easier. We call it multi and single, following the same pattern. And what is awesome here that we use once again we use the latest features. So it's based on Concurrent Flow API, which is available to us from Java 10, I guess. Yeah. And that means that many, many other frameworks are just moving to the Flow API. We use it from the very beginning. So that means that you follow the same ideas uh, of you that you learned from, from Spring. Uh, you just call Flux multi and uh, single, and uh, mono you call single. And you have the same set of operations, but they are now happening asynchronously, they are now happening reactively. We have our good set of operators, uh, reactive operators, uh, flat map, of course, all of them. If you, how many of you code reactive, by the way? Okay, that's impressive. Yes, but expectable, expected. So, <laughs> so uh, that means that we are very fast, so that means that with the competitors, we are sometimes twice as fast. And that's why we have created our own reactive web server, which actually, I'm not going to dive too much into it. Uh, you just create a server, and you just run it, and it runs everything reactively inside, and uh, provides you uh, reactive API for every call. So you do everything reactively. Once again, reactive, think, uh, reactive paradigm has one tiny drawback, I would say. Once you get into this world, you have to do everything reactively. So once reactive, always reactive. You can't do part of the code which is reactive, the other part which is blocking. Sorry, this one won't work. So that's why for messaging, there is reactive messaging, by the way, based on microprofile reactive messaging. So uh, you just combine the channels, do publisher, processor, subscriber, like, we, like in the APIs, and it simply does everything reactively. Uh, even for database, you know that JDBC is blocking. Well, because because it's the old, one of the oldest, actually, technologies that is, which we use in Java words. So, and to make a 
a synchronous driver work in a synchronous environment. We create our own DB client, which actually runs this client inside of a of a of a different database uh, of a different executor, which is kind of cool. But uh, once again, it's it's a little bit ch not cheating, but you know we are making additional additional. Um, how we call it? Uh, we ha we have to care about it because it is reactive. So, the same is for web client. We are not only like uh, providing uh, services um, like REST, but we also consume them. And consuming them reactively is also necessary. So that's why, to make the full cycle reactive, we also have to do reactive client. So we also provide it. So that means that whenever you try to do everything reactively, you have the full uh, infrastructure here. But uh, I really like that. Uh, I believe uh, only two people have raised their hands for reactive. Yes, it is hard. Would you confirm it's hard? Yes. So um, uh, we will see a little bit later in the code that uh, it looks nice. We know that reactive currently is the best in performance because, once again, I'm not going to dive too much into the details. But uh, the utilization of, of processor there is the best because we are asynchronously doing it. Processor is simply not waiting. And uh, it is what it is. But uh, m the typical question on my previous talks about uh, Helidon uh, SE is how do you debug it? Well, with, with uh, well, I, I, can't, I just, just uh, system out print line is the best thing you can do there. <laughs> you don't have wonderful struct traces that you can read. Uh, it's, uh, if there are more tasks running in parallel, it's really, really tough. And of course, how many of you know the, the combination like call, callback hell? So you really can easily get into callback hell and it will be painful. So uh, most of the reactive programmers, like this gentleman, should learn a, a lot of money. That means that uh, for like you know, I, I've not only been a developer in uh, in terms of uh, developing frameworks. I've been on the other side. I've been the consumer. I have been even the manager of of uh, of uh, uh, such projects. And it's really hard to find good programmer who knows reactive programming. I know three people who do this, and they're very expensive. Like you know, they're really expensive. But so because they are the only one who are able to read something like this and to debug it. Yes, I just take it, by the way, from one of our examples in our code base. Yes, you can see that uh, you start like, you know, server, you build it, then you create routing, and there is a lambda, and whenever, you know, the result is sent, like multiple values, you pick one of them, and if there is a problem, you know, you gracefully close the connection. If there is no, you return a single wrapped result with connection, which is completable future called complete method. Whenever it's ready, then you map it with limit. Uh, I need to drink some. That's just a second. <laughs> Yeah. Then you flat map it, and then you uh, build, start it, and await it with timeout, because it may not finish. And you know, we always oh no, no, put this this part here. Now try to debug this. No, it is hard. It definitely is hard. Currently, with the modern Java that we have, it is the hardest part. I mean, y if you need the performance, if you don't need the performance, like you know, you will use for us. You don't. You use Helidon MP which is nice, beautiful. There are a few annotations. You put them, they do the magic for you. It's debuggable, it's writable, it's cute. But if you, like, for example, need the performance, you will take Hildon C. That's what actually people do. Yes, uh, of course, Formula One is nice, but have you ever tried to write Formula One? I, I tried. There was a double-seater Formula Ones, you know? And I simply did not understand what happened. Like, you know? <laughs> It's not comfortable, it's not, it's very fast, but you need to somehow control it. That's why, as a Formula One pilot, so I know uh, developers who create um, reactive applications are, are, uh, are really cool professionals. I'm not one of them, and it's really, and I really struggle out of it. But uh, it's funny, by the way, that um, you, you almost probably see Helidon, I haven't heard this, what is it? 
But Helidon was invented uh, in Oracle exactly for mostly internal purposes, then it was open source. But you'll be surprised that Helidon is actually everywhere, even in your phones. So uh, there is one thing called Oracle Hospitality. Um, and it simply connects all the hotels, ship, uh, ship you know, companies, uh, like every day. So if you book something, it most probably goes through Oracle Hospitality. And uh, uh, it is actually served by mostly Helidon SE native image built uh, microservices. Each of them are really tiny, so they're 10 megabytes like size. And they're working on millions of requests in fully asynchronous mode. And the scalability is just awesome. So whenever there is something that you in milliseconds start, you know, thousands of them, and then you shrink them if you don't need it. Exactly like any other talk talk on this conference. <laughs> like you know, it simply happens. Uh, so but this is it. So Helen ISE is really cool, and I know the guys who actually code on that, and they are awesome. But if it is too hard, it's nice to. Uh, we have so many heard so many things about reactive code, but what is it too hard? And here comes the holy salvation, I would say, <laughs> called the Project Loom. Now this is really, really, um, I would say, a milestone um, on the mountain. Not even a milestone. It's it's a change of epoch of eras in Java. Let's be honest. How many of you have been today on uh, José Palma talk? Uh, so, I believe he gave you a wonderful explanation what it is, but I will a little bit, you know, um, describe what happens. So, project loop. So, it's, it's there for actually, I believe, seven or ten years or something like this. So, it's fairly old. Um, not as much as Valhalla, by the way. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's a fairly fairly old research project. What does that research project mean? That means that uh, it's like a fork of uh, JDK which focuses on one specific problem. So there are, I believe, four or five of them that happens uh, in parallel. So one of them on focus on, uh, on startups. This one is focused on so-called virtual threats. Virtual threats so, uh, are actually um, the idea is that, I will jump into the idea, but the idea is that uh, last year they finally got some shape and it was uh, it is already available to us in form of this JEP 425. So what is the idea? Uh, if you learn Java, have you heard of green threads? In the beginning, somewhere in the beginning. So what does that actually mean for you? So green threads, do you remember what it was? It was the ability to run one uh, you know, programmatic, uh, multiple programmatical threads on one thread, actually. Now, Project Loom step a little bit further. It can run multiple virtual threads on multiple so-called carrier threads, which are real threads used in our operating system. We know that uh, Java simply wraps the, um, wraps the uh, operating system threads. That means that threads are a very expensive resource. That means that creating threads, switching between threads, all of that is very, very resource uh, consuming. So I believe that uh, on a normal system or even a server system, it is extremely hard to run more than 400 threads. I believe then you're out of memory, then the garbage collector starts you know, doing some crazy stuff. And uh, yes, uh, threads are a very, a very expensive resource. And it's more expensive if you block a threat. So if you block a threat, it simply does nothing. Yes, that's why this reactive programming became so popular, because it does not block, and it simply allows you to utilize a lot of resources. Yes. <coughs> and uh, uh, with the virtual threats, you're able to host a lot of API the same, by API the same threats uh, on real carrier threats. So if a thread got blocked, the JVM cares about it, he founds the block thread, he unloads it from from uh, from the carrier threads, he gives the resources to other thread and uh, allows us to utilize this thread uh, 
uh, it has other other threads to utilize the carry threads. So it's based on for join pool with, uh, and it has implemented with continuation. So once again, like a computer science question, which has no external API, but we don't care about this. So it allows us a new virtual thread executor uh, with some some additional functions. But what is the idea that you can now run on virtual threads? What we did in Helidon is that out of the box, we know that in Netty you can change executors. So even when it was a Loom project, we were able to put in Netty in a virtual thread executor, and it worked, actually. Uh, so uh, that means that just putting another executor, like virtual thread executor, allowed us to uh, open a lot of resources. I'll show a little bit later. And we came up with the idea that uh, if we use microprofile, you don't need to rewrite anything. You just receive a lot of performance boost out of the box. And well, the interesting thing that it is available uh, since JDK 19 plus. So as we use always the newest features, it's there. But we understand it's like a putting electric engine on on, uh, on, a, on a regular car. So it's still a car. It's still it's designed for petroleum engines. It still has all this, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, gasoline tank and so on and so you don't need it. So we decided to create our own server based on virtual threads from scratch and it's called NEMA. So technically it's uh, the first framework based on virtual threads in the world. Uh, it's fully blocking, there is no asynchronous thing at all. So and it's good that it's built completely with collaboration with Java team. We're just one chat away, so we have some advantage here. We just talked to the, to the, uh, to the uh, Java team guys. Uh, and we received a performance compatible to Netty, so it was simply totally rewritten from scratch. And it's available as alpha versions, uh, already in Maven Central. Today we released alpha 6, by the way, and I tweeted it right before this talk. So what is the idea? Why Helidon is cool? Because you can, it's modular, as you see. You can just remove all of that stuff which happens underneath and replace this layer, with, uh, with which we did with NEMA. So the migration path for us was extremely easy. Just to say that we support HTTP 1, 2, gRPC protocol out of the box, uh, with all this TLS, MTLS stuff, etc., etc., with uh, core support, with static content, everything is already available, so we're coding it. And what is the good? That it's all based on the newest features of Java. Virtual trains, of course, and hand switching sealed classes, system logger. That means that we don't have any legacy behind us. We use the newest features, and as a result, uh, what we have. So the threat model is this, that for HTTP use two virtual threads, for HTTP, HTTP 1, HTTP 2 use uh, two virtual threads per connection and one for stream, and uh, all the routing goes for virtual threads. And you may say why we should actually do it. This is the first why. You see the code on your, uh, on your uh, left. This is the asynchronous code, which is not debuggable. And on your left, this is the code which you get when you use blocking API. You don't need to do all this, I don't know, uh, uh, how you say it in English? <laughs> like, you know, uh, improvising and trying to understand what happens. You simply use the code that you learned almost in school. I don't know, you learn programming here in France in school. Yes. You do it the same way as you learn. So if I jump to the demo that I have, uh, let's, uh, yes, movies. So we have two services, uh, which is reactive service. By the way, as you see, uh, I'm just using the low-level stuff, I would say. Uh, you can see this, read this at the end. Should I make it bigger? Is it okay? Good. I use dark phones, sorry. So that means that we start our server, and uh, the idea is that uh, whenever you try to uh, use a service, what you do? For example, you have to give several movies. I don't know, I use, uh, this is an exam example of our architect, Tom Lange. So you give a multi-range of some movies which flat map, then collect to list, then map. If error occurs, there's do something else, then you receive for circle. It's undebuggable. It's okay, it's fast, but it's undebuggable. If you do the same stuff with blocking service, yes, you just write the code that you like to. 
so you just well, try something you calculate that you do just four cycle four do something whenever there is a uh, future just respond add and that's it and it can be run fully and debugged in easier way so that means that by the way that what's cool about it what NEMA itself as you say is a is a is a, is a Java server that means there's just a main method by the way this is how you confirm it just build do the routing on this port and it simply works so you can simply run it or debug it uh, IntelliJ you can debug it let me just yeah, debug it and uh, it will just simply run you see it's it's fractions of a second it's alpha 4 and whenever a request or response come so it's curl uh, 8080 you can simply debug it directly from your EDE which is just perfect you have a wonderful stack trace and it works perfectly that's it in in the in the other world it won't be that easy as that well uh, so this is I would say the first the first good example of why we should switch so I don't have much time I would really dive into more details but uh, I need to tell you more so by the way the examples will be available I will tweet about them you can easily play with them so you can compare the um, the reactive way of doing stuff and just the regular way of doing stuff the way we used to learn in school this is the first question uh, this, this is the first uh, uh, thing by the way just to show you that uh, if you want to start a new project we already have this uh, wonderful starter so you just go to helidon.io push the starter and you create your project and unlike other frameworks it's created like step by step so if you use the Helidon CD, uh, CLI you can also use it it will do absolutely the same for you so and now we come to the second actually questions why we should do this and uh, this is the answer so the performance I was talking about uh, in the beginning so if we use Netty for request per second it's already beating Netty in terms of, uh, of performance that means that uh, it already serves a little bit more requests than just Netty and if we put it in a, a micro profile environment that means that we have a magnitude like three times faster performance you simply do nothing you simply upgrade the version of Helidon and it will do this for you you get it out of doors you don't have to rewrite your code even if it's blocking it will just be that fast let us jump to another demo I want to show you actually you will under I hope sorry I hope you will understand from this demo why it actually happens uh, sorry where it was tell it on loom yes so I have created it's not me I have extended this example it's our architect Thomas Lange who actually created this demo uh, but I will show it to you so we have a server which is quite easy uh, so these are typical uh, micro profile uh, annotations they're very close to uh, to um, uh, spring annotations almost the same but like instead of auto wire you have inject yes get path and so on and so on. so get two endpoints one is a quick request it just returns something like done another one is a slow request it sleeps for some seconds 10 seconds I guess and then returns the result so we have two types of, of, uh, of requests one is quick and one is slow as you see here the slow request is blocking that means it's not reactive that means it will just block the thread and sleep for 10 seconds and do nothing um, this way we waste a lot of resources there is the same uh, way done in reactive that means that uh, if we uh, go the same way uh, we just get a slow and quick quick just re re sends a request and here it's a little bit tricky because it's very hard to try to sleep in uh, reactive world we just use a different scheduler and we sleep there and let us see and then we have two uh, clients who pull quick endpoint and slow endpoint let me just uh, open just a second let me open a, a terminal and in terminal I have uh, a window set specially for the conference yes so what we will do we will start our service with no loom it will serve our request now if we start a slow uh, slow client uh, wait a second target and client 
it will start polling the server. That means that it will start getting the result. As it sleeps 10 seconds, you see we have 10 sec I, I By the way, I especially limited the thread pool for 10, 10 threads here, just to be completely sure that it works. So it's, uh, it's for demonstration purposes only. So, uh, target, and uh, or it was client, client quick. That means that whenever those threads sleeps, the quick request cannot be done. You see the, the number of errors. That means that this quick request response simply can't beat through that sleepy request. And if we do an htop, uh, it's as you see in demonstration directly, the system utilization is really small. We simply don't use it. It sleeps all the time. It's, it's, uh, in your case, it can be pulling to a database or making I.O. operations. It sleeps. It does nothing. So utilization of the service is really slow. Then I stop this thing and do the very same with the reactive way. So if I do uh, reactive, uh, target, uh, yes, server reactive, you will see that all of a sudden the sleeping threads are sleeping and it's doing the okay, but the s the threads with the quick res request response are beginning to to reply. That means that we st they are not blocking the thread, and we start utilizing these threads actually for other purposes. So that means, as you see, even the CPU at some moment just uh, bumped up because we started to use. CPI, a uh, CPU, we started to answer the questions, the, the requests. As easy as that. And now we will do something interesting. We will take the latest, the latest uh, Helidon, which is built on MicroProfile, and run the very same program as, uh, as we did uh, with the no loom version of it. But it already supports virtual threads. Uh, not here, but uh, serve. Uh, Yes, server four, and we run the same. Jar, JJ means jar minus minus jar. Yes, you see, all of a sudden, we begin with the blocking code that we use. We started to reuse this uh, this uh, resources. That means that JVM now, as we have virtual threads, now we have switched the virtual threads underneath with NEMA. Uh, the very same code as did not work for us, now with the virtual threads, it simply works and it returns near to reactive performance. As you see, the number of request responses is almost the same. Uh, request re response performance, and that means that we are simply reusing the virtual threads. And it is cool because this is exactly what we need in microservices world. We are full of, uh, of, uh, of small requests and responses. I will just stop it for now. Sorry, just because I have a few slides to show you more. Um, why is that actually important? Let me just, just back, get back to it. So once again, we instead of actually reusing putting electric engine on the car, we created a completely new platform based on virtual threads, which is specially designed to work in that environment. So what is the idea? What problems we don't solve? We don't solve so-called obstruction of the threads. That means that we know that microservices uh, serve quick request responses, and we know that we can reuse them, and we know if a request and response sleeps, we can use this, uh, not sleeps, but for example, is waiting for I.O., waiting for database calls, we can use its resources and give it to other other, mi uh, other uh, micro, uh, microservice request response. So if you're mining by bitcoins on your machine, you won't get any performance. Yes, because it will be busy with that. But we know that we are with quick uh, requests and response, and this is why we know that with virtual threads we gain exactly what uh, uh, what we need. The JVM simply see what resources are not used, and with this virtual thread management, it gives us to to the system back. So interestingly, that uh, uh, for as a result, um, uh, there are interesting observations like for example if you write sockets so in linux there are asynchronous sockets if you do things asynchronously with blocking code the performance will degrade even the sockets themselves that we use in in linux they have to be uh, they have to be um, blocking that's why jvm can manage better the performance that we have there uh, so uh, 
as a result, uh, that means that uh, uh, the performance with blocking sockets is much better. So that means that we had to unlearn actually to do everything which is uh, asynchronous. Uh, we were able to do our good uh, HTTP2 uh, routing with virtual thread support. It was hard. gRPC is even easier than it was in, in Netty. And once again, we are now actually rewriting some of the components of uh, Helidon to be completely blocking, but some of them is actually like reusing them. And as I give it to the car uh, comparison, Helidon NEMA allows us to have a startup time like electric car, you know, they can accelerate in, in seconds, in, in two seconds, like Formula One car. But you can still turn on the radio and enjoy some comfort, not being like in this, uh, in this um, Formula One car, which is a completely, un I don't understand how they drive it. So you have a, a regular car, but with a performance with really close to Formula One. So, and you really have to unlearn to do reactive, because this is why you gather a lot of of, uh, of uh, power. So, what is the I told you what is the actually performance and power? Uh, why is it necessary? So, first of all, you get a reactive performance or near to reactive performance out of the box. And the thing next thing is I'll be ready. Uh, the next thing is you don't have to learn something new. Actually, you just use the way you code or get the code you used to, and this way you uh, gain the same performance just out of the box. And what is good that just a few days ago, virtual threads uh, were announced with JEP444 to go to Java 21. So it was announced just like that. That means that from Java 29, as we also uh, release Skeleton 4, we will be able to use this virtual threads out of the box. And it's pure. JVM performance, so there's no cheating. We don't use any native code or something. This performance is given to you only by the JVM means that you have, and nothing else. Open source with Helidon 4, and if you want to know more, we have tons of social channels. Just write them, write me, write on these channels, watch videos, learn articles. If you have questions, just slack it to us. We have a special support duty person who always answers the questions, even if it's an open source project. Merci beaucoup.